if we can just take a stroll to uh, some of your work that is incredibly surprising, that it works as well as it does, that launched a lot of the uh, recent work with neural networks. If we go to what are now called Hopfield networks, uh, can you tell me what is associative memory in the mind for the human side? Let's explore memory for a bit. Okay, what you mean by associative memory is ah, you have a memory of each of your friends. Your friend has all kinds of properties from what they look like, to what their voice sounds like, to where they went to college, where you met them. Uh, you can go on and on, what, what, what science papers they've written. And if I start talking about a five foot 10 wiry cognitive scientist who's got a very bad back, it doesn't take very long for you to say, oh, he's talking about Jeff Hinton. I never I never mentioned the name yeah. or anything very particular. But somehow a, f a few facts that are associated with this, with a particular person enables you to get hold of the rest of the facts. Yeah. Or, or not the rest of them, another subset of them. And it's this ability to link things together link experiences together, which it goes under the general name of associative memory. And a large part of intelligent behavior is actually just large associative memories at work, as far as I can see. What do you think is the mechanism of how it works in the mind? Is it is it a mystery to you still? Do you have inklings of how this essential thing for cognition works. What I made 35 years ago was, of course, a uh, crude physics model to show the kind, to actually enable you to understand my old sense of understanding as a physicist, because you could say, ah, I understand why this goes to stable states. It's like things going down downhill. Right. And that gives you something with which to think in physical terms rather than only in mathematical terms. So you've created these associative artificial you that, know, that, networks. That's right. And now if you, if you look at what I did, I didn't at all describe a system which gracefully learns. I described a system in which you could understand how things, how learning could link things together how very crudely it might learn. One of the things which intrigues me as I reinvestigate that system now to some extent is, look, I see you, I'll see you every second for the next hour or what have you. Each, each look at you is a little bit different. I don't store all those second-by-second second images. I don't store 3,000 images. I somehow compact this information. Mm -hmm. So I now have a uh, view of you which can, which I can use. It doesn't slavishly remember anything in particular, but it compacts the information into useful chunks which are uh, somehow, it's these chunks which are not just activities of neurons but bigger things than that. Which are the real entities which are which are useful which are useful to you? Useful, uh, useful to you to describe to compress this information so coming, you, at, uh, coming and, at you, and you have to compress it in such a way that if, if I get if the information comes in just like this again, I don't bother to bother to rewrite it, right. or, or, or efforts to rewrite it simply do not yield anything because those things are already written, and that needs to be not. Look this up. Has written it. So I stored it somewhere already. It's got to be something which is much more automatic in the machine hardware. Right. So, in the human mind, how complicated is that process? Do you think? So you you created. Feels weird to be sitting with John Hotfield calling him Hotfield Networks, but uh, it is weird. <laughs> Yeah, but nevertheless, that's what everyone calls them. So uh, here we are. 
Uh, so that's a, a simplification. That's what a physicist would do. You and Richard Feynman sat down and talked about associative memory. Now, if you as a if you look at the mind, well, you can't quite simplify it so perfectly. Do you, you well, think? Well, let, let me back track, track just a little bit. Yeah, biology is, is about dynamical systems. Computers are dynamical systems. Um, you can ask if you want to ma the model biology, if you want to model neurobiology, what is the time scale? There's a dynamical system in which of a fairly fast time scale in which you could say the synapses don't change much during this computation. So I'll think of the synapses as fixed and just do the dynamics of the activity. Or you can say the synapses are changing fast enough that I have to have the synaptic dynamics working at the same time as the system dynamics in order to understand the biology. Most artificial, if you look at the feed-forward artificial neural nets, they're all done as learning. First of all, I spend some time learning, not performing, then I turn off learning and I perform. Right. That's not biology. And so you, as I look more deeply at neurobiology, even at associative memory, I've got to face the fact that the dynamics of a synapse change is going on all the time. And I can't just get by by saying I'll do the act dynamics of activity with fixed synapses. So the, the synaptic, the dynamics of the synapses is actually fundamental to the whole system. Yeah, yeah. And there's no, there's not there's nothing necessarily separating the time scales. When the time scales can be separated, it's neat from the physicist to the mathematician's point of view, but it's not necessarily true in neurobiology. So you're you're kind of dancing beautifully between showing a lot of respect to physics, and then also uh, saying that physics cannot quite reach the the complexity of biology. So where do you land? Or do you continuously dance between the, the two points? I continuously dance between them because my whole notion of understanding is that you can describe to somebody else how something works in ways which are honest and believable and st to still not describe all the nuts and bolts in detail. Weather. I can describe weather as 10 to the 32 molecules colliding in the atmosphere. I can simulate weather that way if I have a big enough machine. I'll simulate it accurately. It's no good for understanding. If I just want to understand things, I want to understand things in terms of wind, wind patterns, hurricanes, pressure differentials, and so on. All things as they're collective. And yeah. the physicist, the physicist in me, always hopes that biology will have some things which can be said about it which are both true, and for which you don't need all the molecular details of the molecules colliding. That's what I mean from the roots of physics by understanding. So, what did again? Sorry, but Hopfield networks help you understand what insight did. It give us about memory, about learning? They didn't give insights about learning. They gave insights about how things having learned could be expressed. How having learned, a picture of you, a picture of you reminds me of your name. That would, but it didn't describe a reasonable way of actually doing the learning. It only said if you had previously learned the connections of this kind of pattern would now be able to behave in a physical way with the day off. I put the part of the pattern in here, the other pattern, the part of the pattern will complete over here. I can understand that physics if the right learning stuff had already been put in. And I could understand why then putting in a picture of somebody else would generate something else over here. Mm-hmm. But it did not under it did not have a reasonable description 
of the learning process. But even, so forget learning, I mean, that's just a powerful concept that sort of forming representations that are useful to be robust, you know, uh, for error correction kind of thing. So this is kind of what the biology does that we're, we're talking about. Is yeah, and, and what my, my paper did was simply enable you, there are, lot, there are lots of ways of being robust. Um, if you think of a, of a dynamical system, you, you think of a system where a, a path is going on in time. And if you think of a computer, there's a computational path which is going on in a huge dimensional space of ones and zeros. And an error correcting system is a system which, if you get a little bit off that trajectory, will push you back onto that trajectory again so you get to the same answer in spite of the fact that there were things so that the computation wasn't being ideally done all the way along the line. And there are lots of models for error correction, but one of the models for error correction is to say, there's a valley that you're following, <laughs> flowing down, and if you push, get pushed a little bit off the valley, it's just like water being pushed a little bit by a rock, it gets back and follows the course of the river. And that, basically the analog in the, in the physical system, which enables you to say, oh yes, Error-free computation and an associative memory are very much like like things that I can understand from the point of view of a physical system. The physical system is can be, under some circumstances, an accurate metaphor. It's not the only metaphor. There are, there are error correction schemes which don't have a valley and energy behind them, but. Th those are error correction schemes which a mathematician may be able to understand, but I don't. So there's a the physical metaphor that seems to uh, seems to work here. That, that's right. That's right. So, so these kinds of networks actually led to a lot of the work that is going on now in neural networks, uh, artificial neural networks. So, the follow-on work with uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and deep belief nets. Uh, followed on from the from these ideas of the Hopfield network. So, what what do you think about this uh, continued progress of that work towards now re revigorated exploration of feed forward neural networks and recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks and uh, kinds of networks that are helping solve image recognition, natural language processing, all that kind of stuff. It always intrigued me that one of the most long-lived of the learning systems is the Boltzmann machine, which is intrinsically a feedback network. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the brilliance of Hinton and Sanowski to understand how to do learning in that. And it's still a useful way to understand learning and understand and the learning that you understand in that has something to do with the way that feed-forward systems work. But it's not always exactly simple to uh, express that intuition. But it always amuses me to see Hinton going, going back to the will yet again on a form of the Boltzmann machine, because really that which has feedback and interesting probabilities in it is a lovely encapsulation of something computational. Something computational? Something both computational and physical. Computational, and it's very much related to feed-forward networks. Physical in that Boltzmann machine learning is really learning a set of parameters for a physics Hamiltonian or energy function. Mm -hmm. 